John Husick. I'm an author, an environmentalist, and journalist. And thank you for watching me today. I'm going to be talking about metropolitan ecology. That sounds like a very lofty thing, but it's very simple. It's it's employing hyperlocal climate action. So what I'm going to be talking about is how you can make a difference in terms of climate action in your neighborhood and in your area. So there's there's a couple of key components to it that I'll be getting into a little bit later. But first, I want to start with a story of hope. I know that when I talk about climate change, when anybody talks about it today, it's the kind of subject where the immediate reaction is people throw up their hands like that Edvard Blue painting the screen, and they're just really frustrated. And there's a lot of despair, you know, and, and it's a hard thing for anybody to get their brain around because it's just a global problem. And we're seeing it every day. I mean, just this past couple of weeks, we saw the worst air quality in our area that came in from the wildfires in Canada. We saw an epic amount of rain when we were supposed to be having a race. Uh, I was going to a Cubs game that day, and it was, it was very, very drenching kind of experience. But, you know, that's, that's what's happening, and, and it's being attributed to climate change, and, and a lot of things are happening. So we're having uh, epic droughts and epic rain events and storm events and all sorts of things such as wildfires and, and these are things that you know taken one at a time we're thinking oh my god that's another thing to worry about but what i'll be talking about is is a way to address these things in your own home in your own backyard um, in your own community and and it's a very hopeful story and first i need to tell you how i came to the subject and this this goes back some 30 years, and I, I wasn't sort of a naturally inclined person to, to get into this, but, you know, I love the outdoors. I love being in nature. I love exploring uh, different vistas and, and uh, geographies. So I was standing in my driveway, and this was when uh, my wife and I had a place out in Western Lake County. And it was uh, a two and a half acre lot. It was it was very large. We had horses at the time, and the horses uh, got their own barn, of course. But we spent a long time uh, rehabbing the barn, and then the house needed work. And this was a nine year period, so this was before we had children. But it was it was great to be out in nature, more or less. We were in an unincorporated area, and I'm standing in my driveway. I'm just kind of contemplating. A big tree it was so big you couldn't get your arms around it. It was like a sequoia. And at one time, lightning had struck the middle of the uh, tree and cleaved sort of a vestibule in the middle of it. it was so big you could just literally walk into it. So I was just like standing in awe of the tree, wondering, you know, hey, tree, you know, you live this long. It was at least 150 years. And I'm not thinking about anything else, but all of a sudden this huge bird lofts right in front of me. And I had no idea what kind of bird this was. It had a, a red head and it had a wingspan, a wingspan as wide as a Subaru. And it just kind of stared at me. I stared at it. I'm thinking, well, bird, what kind of bird? And of course the bird wasn't talking to me at the time, but I interpret it as sort of a celestial messenger. And, and then I had to research to find out, well, okay, what kind of bird was this? And the good part was that it was a sandhill crane. Now, if you've ever seen the birds, they are indeed majestic. Uh, they have the, the bright uh, red plumage on the top and the horse tail. They make kind of a trumpeting sound. And at the time, it was a period in which these were an endangered species. You could, you could hardly see them anywhere. And I thought, well, I have to learn more about this bird. I have to know why they're endangered. I have to find out, you know, why we aren't, you know, helping these birds to fly in our area, Lake County. And I discovered that um, at one time they were hunted for their their plumage, and they used them in ladies' hats. 
Um, and one of the reasons the Europeans came to this part of the world, first of all, was to hunt beavers uh, and trap them and trade uh, with Native Americans. And they took the beaver pelts and turned them into men's so that was that was the stock and trade of this area for a long time uh, in the 17th, 18th century. But spurs were were hunted and turned into cats. So I really was intrigued. And it's it's one of those stories that kind of unfolds once you do a little bit of research. And I discovered that I I didn't know much about the endangered uh, Habitat that they need to survive in, which were mostly wetlands. So they they come up here from the south every year in flocks, and you you can hear them now. But at the time, you you, you couldn't see hardly any of them. Here. So I volunteered to go into a forest preserve and and count them. And it was a daunting task because I go out in, in a very cold, damp pre-dawn April morning in, in our local forest preserve and looked for these birds. And the first couple of years, I was saying to myself, what the heck am I doing here? Because they couldn't see a single darn bird in the sky. I'm thinking, I'm going to see a bird. I'm going to see a bird. And they didn't quite materialize because they were they're kind of rare. It was, took a while. Um, but years later, and this, this literally took decades, they did come back. And, and the big reason is, is that we restored habitat uh, for these birds. We left them alone and, and made sure that they did rebound in terms of their numbers. Now, their cousin, the whooping crane, which are equally beautiful, but much rarer, are coming back much more slowly. And we're trying to make an effort um, in the conservation movement to make sure that they do rebound in their populations. It's, it's a little bit more challenging. I mean, there's I mean, there's thousands of these birds in the sky and in the wetlands around here, but it's 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 not not a big success story for the hooping cranes. But the larger picture is that we did restore habitat. We did respect the need to do this and restore wetlands and forest preserves. And and, and the fact that these birds come up here to uh, nest and to breed. And, and that that is a real harbinger of hope. If we can do that, we can do a lot of other things. And, th and this is one small piece of the puzzle to address climate action, but this is something that a lot of people did uh, through volunteer efforts. And they also um, started thinking about other areas that we could restore. And, and this led to a, a massive sort of campaign to restore biodiversity. A lot of people don't know that Lake County in particular is the most biodiverse state, uh, biodiverse county in Illinois. And, and this is remarkable because we have more endangered and threatened species than ever, any other county. We're making huge strides in trying to preserve and restore habitat. But this, this is what's happening in our greater backyard in the region. And of course, they're doing this throughout the country in Wisconsin, the Henry County, um, just about everywhere where people care about this. But it's it's a particular passion of mine to think that we can do a lot of things to address the need to have biodiversity. And a lot of people think, well, this is great. We have more birds, we have more turtles, things like that. Why is this important to me? Well, we need a biodiverse um, area for every species to survive in the ecosystem. We are all interdependent on each other. It just can't be our species and our highways and our homes. We have to live here in nature. and We're not a part of it. I mean, a part, as opposed to being integrated into it, which is part of my, my view of what metropolitan ecology is. You know something, you can see um, that nature is, is beckoning you. Uh, I hear coyotes every night, and I'll tell you a few more stories a little bit later, but metropolitan ecology, I, I try to explain it in this simple here. Now this is a sun cross. It's a pre-Christian symbol 
and, it, and it's really, if you want to like boil it down, it's like the circle of life. But I've used this as a schematic to explain the things that can go into metropolitan ecology. And it's, and it's not complicated. There's there's four sort of points on the circle and the, the middle of the middle of this is the metropolitan ecology or you, the that part of it. Uh, but there's these four points that are very important. So the top of it, of course, is ecology. Ecology is about relationships. What is our relationship to nature? You know, where do we get our food from? Where do we get our water from? And we have to be conscious of that in, in order to have it uh, work with us, rather than us, than us working against it. The other side is, is ethics. So we, we have a responsibility for future generations to preserve habitat, to make sure we have health, healthy ecosystems. And then, you know, religion is a part of this. We need to be better stewards of the earth. We need to be conscious of what we need to do. And we do a lot of this here in our own community. Um, the economy, of course, is important. So part of this is to make things that we need to do economically sustainable. So if we need to scale up in terms of renewable energy, it has to make sense in that part of it because our economy is, is functioning based on things that produce profit. Hard to get away from that. So that, that is a key component to it. Um, so let's say we take the three R's and reduce, recycle, and my third R is replenish. So how does that work? In an economic scheme, well, we have to make recycling uh, make sense for those who are doing the recycling. We have to make make it you know economically feasible for our communities, um, and we also have to make sure that whatever we do recycle, we can use to replenish the earth. So part of that is is composting. It's it's an idea that I I really love uh, because you are taking waste and you are turning it into soil and if you know something about agricultural issues right now we're losing a lot of topsoil with these epic rains we're having and drought and we need to replenish it and composting can be done in every community um, i know my community has started a trial program to do composting kitchen waste so let's say you have potato peelings or, or carrot peelings, instead of throwing that in a landfill where it produces methane, which is a very potent greenhouse gas, you send it to a third party that composts it and the natural bacteria turn it into soil that you can put back into your garden uh, or you can uh, do community gardening. And that's really something that's not hard to do. It's, a, it's not a, a big scale industrial process. It takes the, the components that make methane out of the landfill and turns it into soil. So that, that's something that any community can do. I know in Lake County, we've uh, started a pilot program through Swalco, which is our solid waste agency, where we, we are trying to do compost on, on a big scale. And, and so far it's going pretty well, but Every community needs to do this and do it. It's just a matter of uh, you saying to the village board or to the township, hey, you know, how do we start a composting home? And then find out if you have a community garden or use it in your own garden. Um, and that's that's a good way to get a lot of people involved. Gardening is is got a huge growth curve right now, and people are getting into it because think about it, you know. A lot of our food is shipped thousands of miles to get it into our local food stores. And if you can grow your own, freeze it, buy it, um, and you have your own food, reduce the carbon footprint. So let's say you have an acre of land. There's, there's a tremendous amount of uh, pesticides, herbicides, and, and fertilizer that have to go in that land, it washes into the the Des Plaines River goes in the Illinois, goes in Mississippi, goes in the Gulf of Mexico, and it causes a huge amount of um, causes death zones. I'm, I'm putting that through 
frankly, because that's what it does. It kills a lot of aquatic life and, you know, there's phosphorus and it causes these blue green algae blooms. So that's the real scary stuff that comes out of agriculture that we have to deal with. And we can't deal with it on our own by saying, hey, recycle kitchen works. Or if our restaurants started to do that as well, and it's certainly possible. So that's the replenished part of the three R's that I think that is something that a lot of people can do and it's it's not it's not a, a, a high tech thing it's it's very low tech so and another part of this is called engagement and and this is the thing that makes this whole wheel turn and it doesn't matter what direction it turns in so engagement is saying to your community well how do we get uh community gardens Going. How do we get our own gardens working? How do we um, ramp up our recycling? How do we do renewable energy? And one of the easiest things we can do is to say, you know, start in our home. How can we reduce waste? How can we reduce our energy or make cleaner energy? So energy can be produced, you know, through solar panels. Which I highly recommend. And I can tell you that when I put my solar panels on uh, about a year and a half ago, I haven't had a electrical bill in about a year. And that's kind of neat because you generate credits for the power you produce. It goes back in the electrical grid. Uh, comment gives you credit on your bill and you're not paying in your you're offsetting the amount of electricity that you're using. Hopefully you're using less electricity. You can go to LED bulbs and go to uh, more energy efficient appliances. All this is available right now. And I have to tell you, right now is the best time to buy an appliance that's energy efficient. It's going to lower your electrical bill. If you have solar panels, you're powering it pretty much yourself, not directly unless you have batteries. That's a whole other thing that's coming on the scene. But, but this is all so, we're in the golden age of energy efficient appliances. Plus you can get a tax credit. There's like a 30% tax credit on a lot of these appliances. There's um, you know renewable energy credit on solar panels through the state of Illinois. And you can start anywhere. Start with your most energy gobbling appliances in your home, which usually starts with your refrigerator, or your HVAC, uh, you get much more efficient um, standard air conditioning and heating. Uh, even better is if you go to a heat pump, which can be up to 400% more efficient, runs on electricity, and you're, you're saving a lot on your, your electric and, and gas bills. So if you've seen your your gas bill over the last winter, it's gone up quite a bit. Uh, it's not that we had a supply dis disruption due to COVID, it's the gas company decided it was going to charge more for it, and they did. But you can lower that bill by having more efficient appliances. You can go to a, a heat pump water heater. Uh, you can also you know, do a lot more things that are not involving combustion, burning fossil fuels. So that's that's where you can start in the home, and that's that's directly impacting your your personal. You're lowering lowering the cost of operating your home, of heating it, and cooling it. You're going to save money, and it's a direct benefit. There's nothing else that you do. You want to save some big dollars. Um, this is a good place to start. It's all good for the earth, and it's just something you can start with right now. Another consideration is food, as, as I mentioned, grow your own, start your own garden if you don't have one. Um, and here's another really neat thing is that you can tell your schools, hey, why don't we get um, our kids started in garden? And I've seen a lot of projects, there's, there's one in my community where they brought in the high school district. There's two high schools in our district and they said to them, well, how would you like to learn gardening? 
So we have we have a farm in the Noble Art community, and and they they work with the high school district. And they said, okay, you can use the greenhouses and you can grow your own. You can sell your your food that you grow here, and we'll teach you how to do this stuff. You know, year round. So not only did they bring in when they asked, you know, the student, hey, you want to do this? A hundred kids like storm storm the, the the classroom and say, hey, we want to do this. How do we do this? How do we sign up? And they get out of the, the, the classroom and it's like they get into the farm and they were really happy. I was just I was just thrilled to see how many kids and how they responded to it getting their hands dirty, they're out in the hot and cold, and they didn't care, but they're growing their own food. And it was, it was kind of a, an experience that builds community. It's, it's a great education to have. And, you know, eventually, uh, they're going to be taught how to prepare meals with the food that they, they grow. Um, there's a couple places where they're, they're trying to, to bring in a chef to teach them some dishes. If you, you cook your own food, it's even better than growing it sometimes. Um, and you again, you save money because if you've been out to a restaurant, it, it's, it's a lot more expensive than it used to be. And uh, you get something fresh in, in terms of a vegetable or a fruit, and it's, it's just wonderful. Uh, so that's something everybody can do transportation. Um, a lot of people have worked electric cars. And you can charge them in your garage. There's more and more charging stations. And now there's just about every kind of vehicle um, that people can buy that are EVs. And you get tax credit for most of them. It's a little bit complicated depending on the car and how much of the car is made here. And you know, it's the biggest credits are on the ones made here in the United States. But there's some huge strides. So the biggest selling vehicle in North America was the F-150 made by Ford. So that's coming out electric version. There's, there's 100,000 people signed up to get that truck as it rolls off the line. It's just starting to. There's, there's a lot of other vehicles. The Postal Service is eventually going to buy some electric um, postal vans. Hopefully, we'll see a lot of these delivery vans that um, come to our neighborhoods will also be electric. So this is happening as the battery technology improves. Hopefully they'll use less metals that are hard to get at and, and causing some, some social issues in countries where they're mining it. And the good part of this is the technology is improving. So if you have your eye on getting an electric vehicle, you know, buy something that's right for your family. And you know that you could probably get a good tax credit for it. And you could probably use it for a long time. And you know, as batteries get lighter and cheaper and lasting longer, it, it'll make even more sense. So as time goes by, this story gets much better. So that's that's very encouraging. Um, so transportation-wise, you know, we're we're also in this period where we're trying to figure out, okay, what is the coast post COVID environment look like? A lot of people are, you know, being asked to come back to work. And of course, many of them have gotten used to the idea of sitting in their homes doing the work there, and that's okay. But, you know, a lot of businesses, a lot of uh, offices say, hey, you know, we got this empty space that we're paying rent on. Uh, we need people to, to do some FaceTime with us. So, that whole situation is changing. Uh, you know, Metro Pace, all the transportation agencies are trying to figure this one out. What does this look like when we're back to where we need to be? And, and I don't use the word normal because I, I don't know what that means anymore, but it's, it's a situation where we would love to have more people using public transportation, which is much more energy efficient, but Everybody's struggling to figure out, well, what does that look like? How can we better accommodate people? So it's also a good time to tell your, your public officials that, you know, hey, I'd love to take the train, but I know you get on the bus, but, you know, maybe the schedule's not working for you, but you have to tell them because we're, we're in this period where we're trying to rethink all of this. It's a lot to do at one time, but it's actually a good time to give your opinion on, on how we can improve this. 
and reduce the carbon footprint of transportation overall, get people off the roads. And it's hard to do in the suburbs, but we do have public transportation out here, and it can be improved, and it should be. So this is part of the engagement part of this bill. The more you get engaged, the more you're going to be part of the process to change it to make it better, lower the carbon footprint, say, okay, I think we, I think we're challenged, I think we really uh, for future generations. And, and that's that's the real important part of it, is that we have an obligation to the future to uh, really make this a better world and fix our carbon footprint. All of this stuff needs to be considered. So here's a couple of ideas just to start with. And I just want to end with a really neat story that just came out of my experience uh, in in the forest preserve, I was um, just walking down one of the trails, and I'm thinking, "Wow, oh, this, this is a beautiful day. I'm glad to be out." And I was surprised to see uh, a couple of things that I had never seen before in Lake County. And I'm just walking down the trail, and, and all of a sudden, I mean, the the wonder of nature is that you know experience things have to be out there. So I was um, on the trail and I'm just casually walking down the trail and all of a sudden I see coyotes chasing deer. And they were actually going after the deer. I'd never really see this in nature. I'd seen it on television. I'd seen it in National Geographic specials. It's like, okay, here's, here's the predator chasing the prey. And it was, it was kind of even then, wasn't done with my novel experience. And I saw a gaggle of turkeys walking through the same preserve. And again, this is not something I've ever seen before. Um, just a few miles from my home, I usually see turkeys up in Wisconsin in the wild. But this, this was kind of amazing. And then to top that, I had gone down a trail even further by the Des Plaines River. And I saw a fisherman standing near a creek that went actually out of my community and fed the Des Plaines River. And all of a sudden, he pulls up a fish. And I'm thinking, I think I know what kind of fish that is. Unlike the bird I talked about earlier, this was a northern pike. So I'd only seen the northern pike in like Minnesota, Wisconsin. And it was, um, it was a fish that he just caught. So I, I can't say that he made up the story, but I'd never seen a, a, a freshwater fish like that coming out of the Des Plaines River, which used to be quite dirty. It's been really cleaned up over time. So all these things are real signs of progress and signs of hope, most importantly, that really can tell us that, like, yes, we, we can do something um, in our own homes, in our own community, in our own county region that will make a difference and, and you can be a part of it. And that's the really empowering part of all of this is like we can change the narrative and we will. It's just a matter of us getting involved in emotional connections to the land. And I think a lot of people really do care and, and you know keep these points in mind it's like can we get access to all Stolen duty. We do need to see an ethical component of this. Why are you That's our relationship to each other. Yeah, that's what community is all about. It's about relationships, the people they know down the street, um, the the people who are doing the garden, the people who are are starting new projects and, and really taking care of our parks and our forest preserves and our, every natural area. We need more green space and, and you can be part of it. So that's really the core of my talk. And if you have any other questions, here's my email. It's johnwasick at gmail.com. So that's john, J-O-H-N-W-A-S-I-K at gmail.com. I can email you any number of resources. I have a, have a cheat sheet that that will, can hook you up to places where you buy solar panels and 
get involved in environmental groups. I have a printout here, but I have a digital version as well. Plus a link to um, a really helpful brochure at the site to um, get your own garden and your own uh, yard back to more natural tech. This is a great brochure that the Forest Preserve sponsored. It's called Healthy Hedges. It's not just about hedges, though. It's about, okay, so if you take out some invasive species like buckthorn, which is really nasty in Lane County, um, what are you replacing it? What are some natural um, grasses, sedges, um, flowers? And then there's a whole list of them. And you can do it yourself or work with landscapers. So these brochures are actually available in a digital format. And if you do email me, I will be happy to send them to you. And um, I can tell you as much as you like, but this, this is a very, very useful brochure. If you're just starting out in your yard and want to say, okay, so how do I naturalize my yard or do some prairie plants or reduce some species that are going to attract pollinators? Um, this is a good place to start and it's free. So thank you very much for, for listening and uh, to hear from you. Please email again, johnwasik at gmail.com. And keep in mind that once you get engaged in this, it's it's great because it's good for your well-being, it's good for your health, your um your your mental health, your physical health, and, and just the, the idea that you're connecting to everybody else and it it helps to the community. So thank you very much.